Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, I welcome you to lecture number 18. We are studying the course on ADR and arbitration. And if you recall, uh, we have already finished our discussion on arbitration. In the last class, I was discussing part two of the act in which uh, we saw as to how it is a closed part and how only New York Convention Awards and Geneva Convention Awards are enforceable in part two uh, and how non-convention awards are not enforceable. We also saw that uh, part one of the act only uh, as far as uh, the provisions which relate to court intervention, for example, 9, 27, some of the clauses of 37, only these provisions apply to arbitrations which are foreign seated and towards the end we discussed the aspect of choice of law as to what is the extent of freedom given to the parties to choose law of their, to designate law of their choice. What are the rules to designate proper law of contract, rules to designate proper law of arbitration agreement and proper curial law. So that is what we have discussed. Uh, I, I have already introduced the scheme of this act in the beginning, uh, I said that the Act has got various parts. Part 1 of the Act relates to domestic arbitration, whether it is pure domestic arbitration, that is between two Indians doing their arbitration in India or international commercial arbitration. And I also said that after 2015 amendment, the approach of our law has changed. We used to treat both of these alike, domestic arbitration pure domestic arbitration and international commercial arbitration. But after 2015, international commercial arbitration is treated differently. It is more like the way we treat foreign seated arbitrations. So part one is about domestic arbitration. Part two is about enforcement of certain foreign awards. A new part has come into existence, although it has not been notified so far, called as part 1A. And if you remember, I mentioned some of the provisions of part 1a when I was discussing section 11, the modified section 11. I may also tell you that the modified section 11, the modification which was done in uh, 2019 has not been notified. Part 1a has not been notified. Although these provisions are very important for the purposes of promoting institutional arbitration in our country. We did not give uh, too much of time on part 1a. I requested all the students to go through some of the provisions of part 1a. And now we will be discussing part 3 of the act which relates to conciliation. I will also introduce some ideas about negotiation. So for next three sessions, 18th, 19th and 20th, we will be talking about more amicable methods of dispute resolution. It will include discussions on conciliation, part 3 of the act negotiation which is not any statutory mechanism we will talk about mediation we will refer to some of the statutes which provide for mediation and towards the end we will try to understand something about hybrid methods of dispute resolution so that is the scheme for next three sessions let's start our discussion on conciliation and negotiation conciliation is included in part three of the act you have sections 61 to 81 and a very simple definition of conciliation. You see on, on this slide, you have various definitions of conciliation and the conciliator. Conciliator is a person who is to assist parties to settle their disputes in an amicable manner. So conciliator is assisting parties to settle their disputes in an amicable manner. According to Halsbury Laws of England, Conciliation is a process of persuading parties to reach agreement. So there is no binding element involved here. There is no coercion, use of force, use of power involved here. It is a process of persuading parties to reach agreement. 
and is plainly not arbitration nor is the chairman of the conciliation board an arbitrator so therefore halsbury laws of england essentially distinguishes conciliation from arbitration to give the meaning of conciliation it is something other than arbitration and conciliator is not an arbitrator it is a process in which the conciliator is persuading parties to reach to an agreement which is of course beneficial to both the parties which is acceptable to both the parties the ancestral model law on international commercial conciliation also defines the term the ancestral model law on international commercial conciliation also defines it conciliation means a process whether referred to by the expression conciliation mediation or an expression of similar import so whatever you may call it some jurisdictions may call it mediation some jurisdictions may use the terms mediation and conciliation interchangeably so whatever you call it it remains conciliation whereby parties request a third person or persons third person or persons means there can be one conciliator there can be more than one conciliator it is a process whereby parties request a third person or persons the conciliator to assist them in their attempt to reach an amicable settlement of their dispute arising out of or relating to if you see here a contractual or other legal relationship this is the language used by ancitra so there has to be a dispute which arises out of legal relationship that legal relationship can be contractual can be otherwise and any person who is assisting parties to resolve such a dispute and reach to an amicable settlement is a conciliator and the process becomes conciliation i already said that there is no use of force no use of power conciliator does not have the authority to impose upon the parties a solution it has to come from the parties themselves conciliator is not going to impose his opinion impose his views and in order to therefore make parties to reach to a settlement conciliator is vested with wide powers to decide the procedure conciliator can decide the procedure and the existing court proceedings for example cpc 1908 and evidence act these are not applicable these are not binding so therefore the conciliator is vested with wide powers untrammeled by the procedural laws like cpc and evidence act the conciliator does not have the authority to resolve a conflict but the parties should solve it through agreement conciliator will only facilitate them so it is different from arbitration because an arbitrator puts an end to the dispute by way of a final binding enforceable award whereas a conciliator is not going to solve it parties themselves have to evolve a solution for them that is how it is different from arbitration i said arbitrator puts an end to the conflict in the form of an award which is final which is binding which is enforceable whereas conciliator does not have an authority to resolve a conflict he only facilitates the process of resolution this is how you can define the term conciliation there are very obvious advantages of conciliation a conciliator is not a third party who is not involved in the matter he is actively involved and he is actively involved in doing two things while the process of conciliation is going on first he is suggesting likely solutions and at the same time he is evaluating the costs and risks associated with the dispute so he is evaluating the dispute also and he is proposing solutions also these are not binding solutions so a conciliator who is a neutral person who is an experienced person is doing two things for you for the parties one he is suggesting likely solutions and at the same time he is evaluating the cost and risk associated with the dispute this process is very efficient in terms of time and money it is a fast process and it is cost effective the most important advantage of any adr mechanism is confidentiality and this advantage is very much there in the process of conciliation also we will discuss some of the provisions of part 3 of our act we will see how 
the legislature has categorically provided sections which deal with confidentiality. Confidentiality, the benefit plays a huge role. Confidentiality is between the parties, between the parties and conciliators. And parties prefer ADR because they are assured of confidentiality to the extent that parties willingly disclose even their trade secrets while participating in confidential process which ensures confidentiality. There is one more advantage, the freedom of parties to choose conciliator. The conciliator may be an expert person, may be a person who is good in knowledge of law or discipline specific knowledge. So, you have the freedom to decide who is best suited for your dispute resolution. Therefore, these are the main advantages of the process of conciliation. How conciliation commences? If you remember, we have discussed section 21 of the act which tells us how arbitration commences. An arbitration shall commence when the notice of arbitration is received by the respondent. It is received by the respondent that is sufficient for the process to commence. Now, unlike section 21, conciliation shall commence when the other party accepts in writing the invitation to conciliate. So, on this point, there is difference between commencement of arbitration and commencement of conciliation. Simply receiving the notice of commencement of conciliation will not be sufficient. The conciliator will have to accept the invitation of conciliation in writing. Whereas in case of section 21, arbitration commences once the respondent receives the notice. And in, in conciliation, if the other party rejects the invitation, then there is no commencement. This option is not there in arbitration. The respondent cannot reject the request, reject the notice. Yes, he can avoid receiving the notice. That's a different thing. But he cannot reject the notice. Next point is, in conciliation, if the other party does not respond to your request within 30 days, it shall be treated as rejection. So, in arbitration, you can avoid receiving the notice. You may keep on avoiding the notice. But there is no timeline after which it will be assumed that the commencement has done, arbitration has started or arbitration will not start. There is nothing like that. Here in conciliation, if there is no response in 30 days, then it will be treated as rejection. But before we talk about details of the provisions, let me once again tell you that part 3 of the act applies to disputes which arise out of defined legal relationship. We are mostly talking about commercial conciliation. And this legal relationship, as I have already mentioned, if you recall, we have discussed this language in section 10 of the Act while discussing arbitration agreement. This legal relationship can arise out of contract. It can arise out of other things. For example, there may be statutory relationship, a tort-based relationship, an easement-based relationship. But it has to be a commercial relationship, a defined legal relationship and the dispute must arise out of def that defined legal relationship. So, part 3 relates to such a dispute. When the arbitration commences, I already mentioned arbitration commences when acceptance of invitation to conciliate is sent by the other party in writing. And if he does not accept, there shall be no conciliation or if he fails to respond in 30 days, there shall be no conciliation. Now, let us come to the number of conciliators. You can compare it with section 10, which talks about number of arbitrators. You remember, number of arbitrators shall not be even. But here, there shall be one conciliator or parties may agree to have two conciliators or three conciliators. In case of arbitration, you cannot have even number of arbitrators. We discussed this point, although it is not a mandatory provision, section 10. Why this difference? Because, you see, in conciliation, if you have more than one conciliators, they all have to act jointly. This is not a requirement in arbitration. Arbitrators are like judges of the court. They will write their awards. They may form a majority. They may differ on a point. And in case of even number of arbitrators, if they differ on any point, there will not be any majority and there will not be any award, which is not a case here. 
if you have more than one conciliator, it is incumbent on all of them to act jointly. So therefore, there is no problem if, even if you have even number of arbitrators. So we have understood how conciliation commences. We have understood number of conciliators. Then you have procedure for appointment of conciliators. Keep in mind section 11 which we have studied that talks about appointment of arbitrators. In case of one conciliator, both the parties have to agree on the name. It, is, it shall be done by the consent of both the parties. In case of two conciliators, each party to appoint one conciliator. In case of three conciliators, each party to appoint one conciliator and both the parties will agree on a third name, third conciliator. On this point, there is some difference between arbitration and conciliation. You remember we said in case the number of arbitrators is decided to be three, each party will appoint one arbitrator. The appointed arbitrator shall appoint the third arbitrator. Whereas in conciliation, each party will appoint one conciliator and the parties together will appoint the third conciliator. We also have a mechanism where either of the parties are not appointing their arbitrator or the appointed arbitrators are not appointing the third arbitrator. What will happen then? We said in that case, the aggrieved party may approach the Supreme Court or the High Court as the case may be and the High Court, Supreme Court will make the appointment. We don't have this mechanism here. Why don't we have this mechanism here? Because if a party is not appointing his conciliator, that means he is not willing to go for conciliation and that itself is sufficient to say that conciliation shall not commence. Because you don't have this option in arbitration to say that I don't want to go for arbitration. You don't have this option. Remember section 8. If you have an agreement, you will definitely have to go for arbitration. We don't have something like section 8 here. You don't require, there is no mandatory requirement to have a conciliation agreement just like arbitration agreement. You don't require it. It is good if you have it. But part 3 of the act nowhere says that a conciliation shall be done only when there is a conciliation agreement. No. And therefore, even if there is a conciliation agreement, Parties can still say that we don't want to go for conciliation. We are not accepting the invitation. We are not inviting our conciliator. That is a fundamental difference between arbitration and conciliation. In arbitration, if parties don't make an appointment, Supreme Court, High Court will appoint. In conciliation, there is no such possibility. If parties don't appoint their conciliator, then the process will not start. Parties can appoint themselves. Parties can identify an institution which will appoint for them. Now, a party may request such institution to recommend name, recommend individuals who can act as conciliator or parties may agree that appointment of one or more conciliator shall be done by the institution itself. Both the mechanisms are there. You can request the institution which has been designated for this purpose by the parties to suggest an individual who may be made conciliator in your case or both the parties may agree that let us allow. Let us authorize the institution to do the job of appointing conciliators. But whenever institution appoints conciliators, institution has to ensure that independent and impartial person is appointed. We are familiar with these words, independent and impartial person. Refer to our discussion on section 12, 5th schedule, 7th schedule. An arbitrator must be independent and impartial. Court said that independence is more objective concept than impartiality. If a relationship between judge and one of the parties is established, it is a case of lack of independence. What kind of relationship I am talking about? You have the list of relationships in Schedule 5, if you remember. There are various heads under which relationships have been clubbed. So, if there is a relationship established between judge and one of the parties, it is a case of lack of independence. The second case is even if no relationship established, but the outward appearance of the proceeding suggests that the deciding authority, the neutral third party appears to be a biased person. So, there is no relationship between the judge and one of the parties. So, definitely it is not a case of lack of independence. 
But during the proceeding, it appears that the judge is inclined towards one party. The outward appearance may indicate that there is no impartiality. And that is how in Vostel Pine case, if you remember, Supreme Court said that independence is a more objective concept can be determined at the outset, whereas impartiality is a subjective concept which will only be discovered when the proceedings start. But yes, it is a responsibility of the institution to ensure that an independent or impartial person is appointed. Next point is, a person of a nationality other than nationality of the parties should be appointed as a conciliator. A person of neutral nationality. Now, this approach is visible in section 11 also, in case of arbitration also. If two parties from country A and B are involved in dispute, then a, a conciliator from a third country, maybe C, shall be appointed to conciliate their matters. So, this is how appointment of conciliators has to be done. Section 65 talks about statements to conciliators. Once a conciliator is appointed, he may request each party to submit to him what? Brief written statement. It has to be a fast process. And in their brief written statement, what parties have right to the conciliator? Two things. Nature of dispute and points at issue. You remember section 23, we were talking about pleadings. We said you have to mention the remedy claim, relief claim. You don't have to write the relief which you are claiming here in conciliation. Nature of the dispute and, and issues involved. And this has to be brief written statement, not like a detailed written statement. Now, in addition to the fact that parties have to provide these brief written statements to the conciliator, parties will also have to make these brief written statements available to the other party. Now, the next two parts written here, the conciliator may request each party to submit to him a further written statement of his position. So, oral hearings are not taking place usually. If the conciliator wants to get more clarification on the position held by the parties, he may request the parties to suggest to submit more written statements, disclosing the facts and grounds in support thereof, any document which may supplement it, any evidence which may sub substantiate it. And whatever the party submits to conciliator, a copy has to be given to the other party. At any stage of the conciliation proceeding, the conciliator may request a party to submit to him such additional information as he deems appropriate. So, mostly conciliator is dealing in written submissions. And that is one of the reasons why the process is going to be a faster process. Important thing here is that the written statement has to be a brief written statement including nature of dispute and points at issue only. The next aspect is section 67, that is role of conciliator. We by now understand what the conciliator is supposed to do. It has been written again in section 67 more, more clearly. A conciliator has to assist parties in an independent and impartial manner. We have already understood the meaning of these two terms, independent and impartial manner to reach to an amicable settlement, we understand it, that is the main role of conciliator. While doing it, the conciliator shall be guided by principles of objectivity, fairness and justice. So, whatever you must have learned in principles of natural justice, all that will become reality here. The conciliator has to be guided by the principles of objectivity, fairness and justice. He will take into consideration various points, various things. While assisting parties to settle their dispute, the conciliator shall have regard to rights and obligations of parties. While assisting parties to go for settlement, the conciliator shall have regard to trade usages, the prevailing trade usages, we are mainly talking about resolution of commercial disputes, the surrounding circumstances have to be kept in mind and most importantly, previous business practices between the parties will have to be kept in mind. This is important at any stage, section 67 says. Section 67 of the Act says, at any stage during the proceedings, 
the conciliator may make proposals for settlement of the dispute. So there are two main responsibilities. Conciliator has to help parties to reach to settlement and in the process conciliator may make proposals for settlement of the dispute. That is the crux of section 67. So we have understood the conciliation has commenced, written statements have been given to the conciliator and we have understood the role of the conciliator. The most significant advantage of ADR processes, conciliation process is the aspect of confidentiality. This is the aspect which attracts disputants towards this method of dispute resolution. Confidentiality in our act in part 3 is contained in various provisions, section 70, 75, you have 80, 81, we will talk about these provisions briefly. Section 70 says whatever factual information is received from one party by the conciliator, all those factual information shall be disclosed to the other party. This is an aspect of hearing, you remember, whatever is said against me must be given to me, so that I am in a position to defend my case or refute those or rebut those evidences which are presented against me. So section 70 says whatever factual information is provided to the conciliator by one party, will have to be given to the other party so as to enable him to present his case meaningfully so that he can explain those informations. The proviso is important. Proviso says if I am giving some information to conciliator subject to the condition that it should not be disclosed to the other party. If I am giving some information to the conciliator subject to the condition of confidentiality then Conciliator shall not disclose those information to the other party. This is confidentiality. Conciliator will not inform those things to the other party if there is condition of confidentiality. Section 75 requires the conciliator, the parties to keep confidential all matters relating to conciliation proceeding. So parties are obliged, the conciliator is obliged. To keep all the matters relating to the proceeding confidential. This confidentiality shall extend to the settlement agreement also. Settlement agreement is the end product of conciliation process. This confidentiality shall extend to settlement agreement means what? Even the settlement agreement is considered as a confidential document. Unless its disclosure is required for enforcement. Unless the disclosure of settlement agreement is required for its enforcement. A similar provision in part 1 is section 42a. Now this is interesting. 75 says that parties and conciliator are obliged to keep everything which has happened in conciliation to be confidential. This confidentiality extends even to the settlement agreement. Even that is a confidential document. Only in one situation where disclosure is required for its execution. Only in that situation it can be disclosed, otherwise it remains confidential. A similar provision in part 1 is 42a, the arbitrator, the arbitral institution and the parties. The arbitrator, the arbitral institution and the parties because tomorrow the appointment shall be done by arbitral institutions, arbitrations are done by arbitral institutions, institutions are somewhere involved in the process of arbitration, therefore we have mentioned the confidentiality obligation is also on the arbitral institution. We can have in the process of conciliation also institutions are involved. For example, I just mentioned that institution may be asked to appoint a conciliator. Now, arbitrator, arbitral institution, the parties to arbitration agreement shall maintain confidentiality of all the arbitral proceedings except award, which can be disclosed only for the purposes of enforcement. We have borrowed this clause from section 75. This came in 2019 amendment and this has been borrowed from 75. And in the process there is a mistake which we have committed. A settlement agreement is not going to be challenged. It is something which is made by the party. So therefore parties are not allowed to challenge it. But an arbitral award is going to be challenged in, in section 34. We have discussed that. And when it is going to be challenged in section 34, it will be disclosed. So therefore, we need to add few more exceptions to the 
condition of confidentiality. Confidentiality extends to award unless its disclosure is required for enforcement or required for the process of challenging the award that has to be added. We did not have it in section 75 because settlement agreements are not going to be challenged. So, therefore, some amendments are required in section 42A, which I just mentioned. We may think of including the word institution here in the proviso also. Let us not put the obligation of confidentiality on conciliator and parties also in case institutions are involved in the process. The obligation should be also there on the institutions. Section 80 and 81 also relate to confidentiality. Section 80 identifies the role of conciliator in other proceedings. It provides that subject to party autonomy, the conciliator shall not be an arbitrator, a representative, a counsel of a party in any arbitral or judicial proceeding. So, a conciliator cannot be an arbitrator between the same parties. He cannot be a representative of one of the parties. He cannot act as a counsel of one of the parties in any arbitral process or in any judicial proceeding. But if parties by their agreement want to allow it, they may allow it because it is subject to party autonomy. Further, it also provides that conciliator cannot be presented by the parties at witness in court or in arbitration. Tomorrow, if the conciliation suppose fails and parties go for litigation, parties cannot ask the conciliator to become a witness. That is not permissible. These are confidentiality. Section 81 relates to admissibility of evidence in other proceedings. There are four things mentioned here, you see. These are not admissible in evidence in any other proceeding. Any other proceeding means whether the proceeding is related to this subject matter or any other subject matter. Whether the proceeding, maybe judicial proceeding or arbitration is related to the subject matter of conciliation or whether it is related to something else, whatever may be the case, these are not admissible in evidence. What are these? Views expressed, suggestions made by the other party in respect of a possible settlement, admissions made during the proceedings. My Lord, this man accepted the proposal given by the conciliator. He admitted all these things in the process of conciliation. You cannot say all these things. Proposals made by the conciliator, all these are not admissible in evidence. The fact that one party had indicated his willingness to accept a proposal for settlement made by the conciliator, this is not admissible in evidence. So, 70, 75, 80, 81, these are the aspects of confidentiality. And if you recall while discussing public policy of India, I said any award passed in breach of sections 75 and 81 shall be considered as violative of public policy of India. We said that. That means now we have understood 75, we have understood 81. That means any award passed in violation of the requirements of confidentiality in conciliation proceeding is violative of public policy of India. There are two more very important provisions in part 3. One is section 73, the other is section 76. 73 talks about settlement agreement. 76 talks about termination. We saw how when it commences, we will see when it terminates. Section 73 says where it appears to the conciliator that matter may be settled. The conciliator shall formulate terms of settlement and submit those terms of settlement for parties for consideration. The conciliator shall formulate terms of settlement and submit those terms of settlement to the parties for consideration. After receiving the opinion of the parties, the conciliator may or may not reformulate the terms of settlement. This is inspired from what? Section 89 CPC. The same language you see. Not inspired, but this is something very similar to what you have in Section 89 of CPC. The conciliator shall formulate terms of settlement. Then what happens? Around those terms of settlement, if parties reach to an agreement, then parties may draw up and sign the settlement agreement. If parties reach to an agreement, parties may draw up and sign the settlement agreement. And if parties request, the conciliator may draw up the settlement agreement. The agreement becomes final only when the parties sign it. Mind, this is an important requirement. Parties have to sign the settlement agreement. 
Not only that, the conciliator has to authenticate the settlement agreement. He has to put his signature and authenticate, authenticate it. Second requirement. First, parties have to sign it. Validity. Second, conciliator has to authenticate it. And third, conciliator has to furnish a copy to each party. Section 74 says that such a settlement agreement, this is the end product of conciliation. This settlement agreement has the status of Settlement award of section 30. You remember we said parties may be encouraged by the arbitrator to go for more amicable methods of settlement. And once they settle their matter, the same shall be recorded and has the status of any other award. So settlement agreement of section 73 by virtue of section 74 has the status of settlement award of section 30. So a settlement agreement may be drawn up by the parties. Parties may request the conciliator to draw up the settlement agreement. The important thing is Parties have to sign it, conciliator has to authenticate it and conciliator has to provide a copy to the parties. There are four methods, four methods of termination of proceeding. Section 76 says when the parties sign the settlement agreement, the proceedings terminate on the date of signing. Second situation. After consultation with the parties, the conciliator may make a declaration that the proceedings terminate because he may be of the opinion that it is not going to be settled. Now, in that case, after consultation with the parties, the conciliator may declare that termination and it happens on the date of such declaration. Parties can together make a declaration addressed to the conciliator that let us stop the conciliation process. It's a consensual process. The day parties withdraw their consent, that is over. On the date of such declaration, the conciliation terminates. And the last method mentioned in section 76 is when one party is declaring and sending it to the other party and the conciliator that let's terminate the proceeding, then it shall terminate on the date of such a declaration. These are the four situations, circumstances when the process of conciliation shall terminate. This is important. It shall terminate on the date when parties sign the settlement agreement. Now, I have mentioned a case, you see, Haresh Dayaram Thakur versus State of Maharashtra 2000 Supreme Court. This is the case in which Haresh Dayaram Thakur purchased the flat from somebody and the flat was not regularized in his name when authority inspected the flat. It was decided that the flat is not in the name of Haresh Dayaram Thakur, so therefore they be evicted. Leave was granted to them to get the flat regularized in his name. When he filed an application before the authority to get the flat regularized in his name, his younger brother, Pitambar Dayaram Thakur, files a writ petition in the court saying that I have also paid money in purchasing this flat, so the flat must be regularized in my name also. High court sends the matter to the authority to dispose it off at their level. Authority does some inquiry and finally regularizes in the name of the elder brother Haris Dayaram Thakur. A writ is again filed. Now in this second writ, it was agreed by the parties in consultation with the court that lets the matter be sent for conciliation. And the parties agreed and undertook to the high court that the decision of conciliator will be final and binding on both the parties. And therefore, High Court appointed somebody as the conciliator in this case, a retired High Court judge. And the learned conciliator was asked to submit the report in six months. The conciliator conducted various meetings. In the penultimate meeting, in the minutes, the conciliator writes that after hearing both the parties, the conciliator suggested the matter may be settled on these terms. Party A will pay some money to party B. Party B will forego his claim on this flat. Some mechanism, some proposal was suggested. In the final meeting, the councils argued on the quantum of money to be paid by party 1 to party 2 and therefore it was finally decided nothing remains to be done and, and now the conciliator will prepare the settlement agreement. Conciliator prepares his proposal. Proposal 
in the form of report and writes what has to be done by whom. He did not give his proposal to the parties, did not get the signature of the parties and in fact he submitted the proposal in sealed envelope to the court. Now, both the parties argued that this is not acceptable, it is not a valid settlement agreement. But the division bench of the high court says that both of you undertook that you will accept the final outcome of the conciliation, it shall be binding on you, it shall be final between you. Now, you cannot say that we are not going to accept it. In fact, the whole process started out of writ petition, so therefore, this settlement agreement is now given the status of an order under writ petition and it is therefore now final on you. The matter goes to Supreme Court. Now, this is important to understand. Supreme Court says that there is a method prescribed for conciliation. Part 3 clearly prescribes a process. What has to be done by whom in what manner? Most importantly, section 73 says, Parties may draw up the settlement or parties may request the conciliator to draw up the settlement. Conciliator has drawn up the settlement. That is fine. That is not problematic. Problem is the so-called proposal, the settlement agreement was never given to the parties. Whereas section 73 identifies three requirements. It must be signed by the parties which has not happened in this case. It must be authenticated by the conciliator, again not, not visible and a copy must be furnished to the parties. None of these requirements have been followed, so therefore this proposal cannot be called as a valid settlement agreement. When law gives you a method to do something, do according to that method, that is what Supreme Court says in Harris Dayaram Thakur versus State of Maharashtra, year 2000 Supreme Court. The next aspect which we want to discuss, which I want to discuss is the process of negotiation. Negotiation is a process which is based on one-to-one -one conversation. We discussed conciliation, which is two parties settling their disputes with the help of a third neutral party. Here, it is one-to-one -one conversation. There is no third party involved. It is a method of dialogue between two or more parties in an effort to resolve their differences and arrive at a mutually agreeable settlement. The aim of this discussion is to solve the dispute, to solve the conflict. The idea is when we negotiate, we have to understand that we have to give up some portion of our claim to get the rest. This is an important statement here. When we are negotiating, we must go and sit across the negotiation table with this thought in mind that we will have to give up some portion of our claim in order to get the rest of our claim. It has to result into a win-win situation. Both the parties have to win. But it is not always easy for parties to ultimately reach to a win-win situation. Because somewhere in the back of mind, parties have this tendency to maximize their gain. They may not disclose it, but when they are talking to each other, they have this thing in mind that they have to maximize them, their gain. And therefore, what I am trying to say is, if you know that you have a good alternative present, then the, the chances of, of negotiation will go down. Importance of negotiation increases when you know that the alternative to settlement is not good. Negotiation is all about bargaining and it is a process of communication between the parties to find an acceptable solution. This process, as I said, is not very easy. Every time it has some inherent problems. There may be a situation when parties start talking at each other. They are not talking to each other. They are talking at each other, which eventually results in a situation where parties are not willing to talk to each other. In direct negotiation, many a times animosity pervades. The atmosphere becomes very strained. Further, there is always a tendency that parties reveal as little information as possible. And when you have this tendency to reveal as little information as possible, you will end up achieving nothing, no agreement. The chance of success of negotiation is high when parties are prepared to be open, to share information without hesitation. 
in order to maximize your gain somewhere in the back of your mind. Therefore, you want to hide informations. You want to know about others' interest, not disclose your interest. That is not a good situation for success of negotiation. So, when the information is withheld and the focus is only on self-interest, this is not a good situation for success of negotiation. It should be open. The communication must be open. We must focus on interest of both the parties. When you are self-centered, when you are withholding information, it is not different from adversarial approach. What do we do in adversarial approach when the parties are pitted against each other? They, want, they don't want to disclose the information. Now, this is where the role of a third party becomes important. A mediator comes into picture and converts the story from self-interest to mutual interest. So, there are certain inherent problems in negotiation. We understand that conflict is inevitable, but fair and efficient resolution of that conflict is not. We need to talk about more and more options to settle the matter. We need to create more and more options in the light of what? The underlying interests of the parties, preferences of the parties, needs, priorities. On the basis of these aspects, we have to create more and more options. Don't stop at one option. That will be like a dead end. If it appears that we, the parties are not coming close to each other on, on, on some issue, explore another option. Go to some other option. That is how you can avoid dead end situations. There are resolutions which can serve the parties better. Parties will be in a win-win situation. There are possibilities. Yet, parties don't reach on these. Why? Because there are certain impediments. There are certain barriers. What are those barriers? I have identified some of the barriers to successful negotiation. For example, strategic barrier. If parties get into strategies, that will be a barrier. I have 10 apples. You have 10 oranges. I don't like apples. You like both. I request you to give me five oranges, take five apples. You enter into a strategy. This man does not like apples. I can exchange one orange against five apples. Now, this is a strategy which you are making in your mind. This will become a barrier for settlement. The second is principal agent barrier. I myself is not going to the negotiation table. I am sending my agent, the interest of agent. The concerns of that agent will be different from the interest of the principal. And therefore, there may be barrier. There may be cognitive or perceptive barrier. Each party has its own perception or feeling over an issue. When do we take gamble? We don't gamble for profit. We gamble to avoid loss. Now, people have different perception about about the risk which they want to take in relation to avoiding loss or in, in case of maximizing profit. The last one is psychological barrier. This is very interesting. Concessions offered are rated lower than concessions that are withheld. Go to a market. Ask the price of a product. He will say 200 rupees. You bargain. You say, I, I, I want it in 100 rupees. If he immediately agrees, you will not purchase it. Because... The concessions offered are not respected. The concessions not offered are seen with suspicion. This is psychological barrier. So, these are the barriers which have to be overcome. And there lies the importance of mediation. A third neutral party, a neutral third party, will help parties in overcoming these barriers. In negotiation, there is always a tension between desire to compete. I understand that. I have to maximize my profit. I also have this feeling that I have to cooperate with the other party. This tension between desire to compete, desire to cooperate leads to failure of negotiation. You have to emphasize here, desire to cooperate. The size of your pie will definitely increase. Don't worry about that. If you focus here, the size of your pie will definitely increase. Forget about this. Don't compete. But yes, it is advisable for the parties to reach the negotiation table with some preparation already done. There are three things which you must know. One is B-A-T-N-A, Batna. Batna means best alternative to negotiated agreement. What is your best alternative? 
if negotiation fails. Next is Vatna, WATNA, worst alternative to negotiated agreement. What worst can happen if there is no settlement? And third is MILATNA, most likely alternative to negotiated agreement. What is the most likely situation I will find myself in in case negotiation fails? One must know his Vatna, Vatna and most likely alternative. Because these help you in the process of negotiation. Because if you know your best alternative, your power to negotiate increases. I know that even if it fails, I have a very good alternative. Then you are powerful in bargaining, in negotiating. Worst alternative enables you to assess the advantage of, of, of settlement. If it fails, I will be in this worst situation. And most likely alternative to negotiated agreement it enables you to be prepared with an alternative if you failed in the negotiation to achieve what you wanted. So these are the three important things which you must know before you go and participate in negotiation. I have identified some of the styles of negotiation. There may be competing style where participants value their interest more over the interest of others. Accommodating style where the participants value concerns of others equally. Third, compromising style. Parties recognize that both have to give up something to receive something. Then you have avoiding style. The participant does internal cost-benefit analysis. Is it worth engaging in conflict? The last one is collaborating style. The participant tends to value discussion of the conflict and desires to jointly solve the problem. Jointly solve the problem. Collaboration is the key word. So these are some of the styles of negotiation. Competing style, accommodating style, compromising style, avoiding style, collaborating style. I have identified a list of words which are not conducive for negotiation. In fact, these words are not conducive for success of any kind of ADR process. What is your credibility? This is your fault. This is your, uh, you are to be blamed. The delay has happened because of you. Take it or leave it. The bottom line is, this is my proposal. There are expressions of frustration which is not good for negotiation. Dead end statements are not good for negotiation. Reactive statements are not good for negotiations. So in the present session, what we discussed, we understood the meaning of concepts like conciliation and negotiation. We discussed that conciliation is a statutory mechanism. And according to Supreme Court, as we discussed in Haris Dayaram Thakur case, if you remember, I said Supreme Court says if there is a method to do something given in the act, do it according to that method. On the other hand, negotiation is not a statutory process, but it is considered to be the most, most flexible and informal method of dispute resolution. There are shortcomings. There are possible barriers, but those shortcomings, those barriers can be taken care of by a mediator. Such guided negotiation, a negotiation guided by the mediator becomes a process called as mediation. And therefore, the next session, lecture number 19 shall be on the concept of mediation. So that's all for this lecture on conciliation and negotiation. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. I am uh, A.K. Sharma and I am Professor of Sociology at IIT Kanpur. The question I am going to address is uh, what is urbanization? Urbanization is essentially the process of population concentration, which means that 
if more people start living in a smaller number of places or if the distribution of population uh, becomes more unequal like more people living in places like Bombay, Calcutta, Mexico, uh, then we say that the urbanization is taking place. Essentially, it means increase in percentage of population living in areas or localities which are defined as urban. Urbanization is a new phenomenon, of course, a post industrial phenomenon. About 200 years ago, hardly 5 percent population of the world lived in urban areas. And today, more than 50 percent population of the world is living in urban areas or localities which are classified as urban. You will be happy to know that uh, according to 2011 census of India, in our own country for the first time, increase in the urban population has been greater than the increase in the rural population. Though India is not so urban as the developed countries and about 31 percent population of India only is living in urban areas. We can believe that uh, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time, India will also be more urban, at least more urban than what it is. It may not be 80 percent, but certainly it will be 35 percent or 40 percent. Now, how is this uh, urban locality defined because this definition of locality as urban or rural is crucial to major level of urbanization. I will give you definition of our own country. In Indian census, an urban locality is defined in two ways. There are statutory towns and there are census towns. All places with municipality, municipal corporation, cantonment, or notified town area committees are called urban. This is statutory definition. According to demographic definition, there are three main criteria. Uh, if a locality has more than 5000 people or 75 percent of male labor force is engaged in non-agricultural activities or the density of population is 400 per square kilometer or 1000 per square mile, then we say that the locality may be classified as urban. There are many other additions to this definition. Now, we have the concept of urban agglomeration and many other things, but essentially this is how urban population is defined in India. And as I said that urbanization is associated with economic development and industrialization, same is the case with India. Uh, about 100 years ago in India only 11 percent people were living in urban areas, today 31 percent are living in urban areas and uh, this is obviously linked with economic development of the country, growth of per capita income and industrialization. Uh, I remember that in one five year plan it was mentioned uh, uh, that uh, today you know, this urban population can grow by way of natural increase of births minus deaths in the urban areas itself or through rural to urban migration. Today, uh, nearly 60 percent contribution to growth of urban population is due to rural to urban migration and this is going to increase. This is essentially what urbanization means. Urbanization means growth of population in localities defined as urban in relation to population of localities defined as rural and uh, I have given you in Indian definition. Thank you very much.